what do we do now? This is our city. We do whatever the f*** we want. I haven't talked about this on the channel, but I have always been a Saints Row fan. I have played hours upon hours of every single Saints Row game on multiple platforms, from Xbox to Steam to PlayStation. I even bought Saints Row 3 and Saints Row 4 on the Nintendo Switch because of the simple fact that it's one of my favorite video game franchises, and having the ability to play those on the go was something that I've always just wanted. And when I was in middle school, I would always spend hours upon hours upon hours of just playing Saints Row 2, messing around with cheat codes, just going all over the city of Stillwater. It was one of my favorite games of all time. The point is, I have always been a fan of the Saints Row games, and once I saw that reveal wall for the reboot, and once I found out that we were going to be getting a brand new game in the series, I was personally excited that a brand new Saints Row game was on its way. Then Summer Game Fest happened. The announcement trailer released, received a ton of negativity, and a bunch of fans weren't happy or just even sold. Now I was willing to be optimistic, especially with the poor advertisement when it comes to trying to market this game, and tried to play through this game day one, which is exactly what I did. I never made a review or recorded any sort of footage to even try to make one. So because I like to torture myself, I decided to replay through this entire game in full. Meaning all of the DLC, all of the story, and uh, yeah, just all of the pain all at once. With that being said, my name is Dende, and this is my review of Saints Row 2022. The story begins with the Saints having full control of the entire city of Santo Aleso. They begin to throw this big ass party celebrating the fact that they've won, and a businessman named Antonio shows up with a briefcase full of money for an artifact that we are in possession of. Antonio wants to make a deal with us, and this is where we're introduced to the customization in the game. I will say that personally, I think the customization is okay at best. You're able to make some decent looking characters, but it also just feels extremely limited even compared to the previous games. You can't match match accessories or wear chains and jackets at the same time without it bugging out and just completely disappearing, and god forbid you have long dreadlocks that don't look like absolute trash. Like seriously, the hair options in this game are honestly pretty bad. I will say though, the color wheel being added to the game is something that I do personally appreciate when it so that way you can just fine tune exactly which color you would want that specific thing to be. Antonio, glad you came to your senses. Hey, I'm kind of having a party right now, but we'll talk business later. What the fuck? I didn't even what? <laughs> I didn't even pick this voice when I originally made this character. No, what? Antonio, glad you came to your senses. Hey, I'm kind of having a party right now, but we'll talk business later. We then recorded TikTok to search for new recruits when suddenly we are bleeding in the middle of the floor outside of the church. We then buried alive and that's the game. Roll credits. Is what I would have said if I just wanted to end the video here, but sadly we still have more to talk about. But before I do, I kind of want to just say that I wish this scene was just not included this early within the story. It kind of takes away the elements of surprise when you look into playing the rest of the story, so you kind of just know exactly what's going to happen. It, it's, it's just not, it's something that they shouldn't have done for the very beginning of the game. We then go back in time to when our character was recruited to a company named Marshall. Marshall is essentially a private owned military group that's owned by a man named Atticus Marshall. 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 Atticus Marshall. Anyways, Marshall is after this guy named the Nawali who has a gang that isn't named at all for some weird reason. You basically just mow through the entire gang, go through a section where you're just shooting through a torrent, meeting back up with your fellow soldiers, you end up finding the Nawali, chasing him, and then boom, big ass cutscene. After the successful mission, you basically get to go to your home base, go into your locker, see the little pictures of your friends. Only for Gwen, who's supposed to be your superior, to come out of nowhere and just berate you for not following orders. And because of this, you don't receive your bonus that you were promised, and she essentially just tells you to fall in line because you just didn't follow orders. After this, you meet up with your friends, who we as the player still have no idea who they are yet, but I just wanted to talk about this really quickly. Before the multiple patches that was done in this game, which I'm, I am playing on a more recent patch for this game, the dialogue was basically doing nothing but just swearing about horse 
testicles and depending on the voice you pick you were just swearing and screaming and saying all sorts of things like sh After your constant swearing fest, you then finally make it home to your apartment where we are finally introduced to your group of friends. This is Nina, this is Kevin, and this is Eli. As an investor, I don't like wasting money. You're wearing a f***ing bow tie. One of the main reasons this story was supposed to be interesting was the fact that these characters were a part of separate gang- I'm sorry, factions, as this game is supposed to- call it. Nina is associated with the Panteros, Kevin is associated with the Idols, and you work for Marshall. Eli doesn't have any faction tie-ins for some reason, he's just there just to be the finances guy. His whole thing is wanting to just be a businessman and he just doesn't really fit the theme of a game like this. In a cutscene that feels just like an awkward sitcom, we learn that Kevin is both a chef and a DJ, and Nina is a former art student that apparently has a lot of college debt. We then find out that the crew is short on money, so they go and rob a pan loan place. This mission doesn't really showcase much other than the fact that they want to beat you to death with the slogan of Be Your Own Boss. Not only that, but it also showcases that the only person that could even potentially be some sort of intimidating to anyone in the city is anyone else but Eli in this group. It really just makes you believe that he's truly the weak link of this entire crew and that the only thing he's really good at is just planning sh After robbing the payday loan place, I'm gonna keep saying that constantly I guess. After robbing this payday loan place, you then get chased by the cops where we are then introduced to car combat and how to drift. It's not the worst kind of driving in a video game, but it's far far from being good. After escaping the cops, you find your getaway vehicle that Nina hid inside of a junkyard, but it's being torn apart by the Panteros. You then are tasked by killing them, and this is where we start to realize the formula of each and every single mission. Drive to point A, escape from so and so, and drive to point B, kill every enemy. When this game released, these guys were just absolute bullet sponges, and it would just be annoying as hell in combat. It's not like that anymore, but the gunplay still just isn't fun in general. After this, you steal a motorcycle, head to the bridge, a cutscene plays, and instead of you driving literally anywhere else, you decide to drive directly into the cops. Well, shit. Nina then shows up to save the day, and you guys make it home with the money. During the car ride home, Nina discussed how you guys are supposed to make money. This is where we're introduced to things such as side hustles. But before we learn about that, we are absolutely cum blasted by the game telling us about every single DLC that we own. Okay. 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 All right. Side hustles are essentially just activities with the majority of them just being either drive from point A to point B, leaving a review on some random location like a donut shop or a trashy motel, or just riding shotgun while a car drives for you from point A to point B. They aren't very difficult, they're just either boring or just tedious to get through. For example, the Atcha activities, difficulty relies on how many stars you leave at a place. The lower the star, the more difficult the enemies are supposed to turn into bullet sponges. I haven't even mentioned how bad the gameplay feels when playing, but it's just not smooth in any way, shape, or form. At least in the most recent patch, which according to the official subreddit made the gameplay feel worse than it did day one. And it's just hard for me to remember how this game felt with day one, Jesus. The next mission has us meeting up with Gwen where she gives us the task to stop a convoy that's being led by the Panteros. The reason why we're stopping them is because they are moving antiquities, which was originally was supposed to have the Panteros meeting up with the Nawali, but because of the fact that we captured the Nawali, it's not happening. With our simple task of follow the convoy and don't f*** it up, we are immediately spotted by Sergio who is the leader of the Panteros. I should probably specify for the people who either don't know or just don't give a sh The reason why I'm saying the Panteros instead of Los Panteros is just so that I don't end up pulling a Troy while him and Dex were talking about the Carnales. I got a lead on where the Los Canales cut all their sh The Carnales. What? Rio Grande River. Jesus. What the f***? It's not the Los Carnales, it's just the Carnales. Los means... F*** it. During this ride to the convoy, we were introduced to Jim Rob, who is a mechanic. We're also being shot at, but that's not important. This part is just another shooting section where we're once again just using a turret. Not only that, but Gwen is just telling us that we were just bait the entire time and that we have a drone following the convoy. 
She then wants us to fall back so that the rest of Marshall could intercept, but we say no and just keep fighting. We hop from car to car to reach every single truck to eventually lead us to the third and final truck. We don't get in time as Sergio busts out a monster truck trying to stop this one person, that being us, on a very, very small vehicle. We keep shooting at the truck and eventually hits a big rock. We reach the final truck, kill everyone in sight, and the truck falls into a ditch. We then have a mini boss fight with a character that eventually just becomes a regular NPC. After beating him and literally shooting him in the face, he suddenly gets back up. We hit him with a rock, and we hit the truck with a rock, and the truck kills him. Our character eventually meets Atticus Marshall for the first time, as well as Antonio Espina. Basically, Antonio wants martial security, but specifically us, as in our main character, to guard the museum during an auction that he is hosting. We take the job and they set up another part for the story, which isn't what we're going to talk about next. Just want to say this real quick before I talk about this next part. This part is technically just filler, so if you don't even want to hear about this next part, you could just skip to this timestamp right here. We meet with Jim Rob, who for the first time is in an empty car lot. He then tells us that he wants to retire and open a garage. But the idol stole the car parts that he needs to even start up his business. He wants us to help him and even offers a profit into helping his garage. We go to the idol's camp, find out where the car parts are by pretending to wanting to be a member after the filler dialogue that absolutely means essentially nothing. We end up finding the missing parts inside of a crate. We get more combat once again, it's more shooting and then after defeating the idols, our boy James Roberts finally opens up his garage which is now titled Jim Robs. I'm just gonna say this right now, I'm not even going to pretend to be angry about the fact that they changed their name from Rim Jobs to Jim Robs because it's not really something that upset me before and it's not something that upsets me now. It's just something that I don't care about. We head to the museum to work security. Everything is going fine, of course. We then meet up with Atticus who asks us the whereabouts of the Hummingbird Codex and we tell him that it's being escorted. We also meet up with a woman by the name of Myra Starr who is on the board of directors. We are then offered to go get a drink by Atticus as a celebration for this auction, and Gwen says no drinking on duty. We then get a phone call from Nina telling us that the Panteros are heading to the museum to steal back the Codex, and at this point, it still just hasn't been explained why it's just important. All we honestly know is that it's an artifact and that's literally just it. What makes it important, nobody really knows. Anyways, the Panteros break inside, and now we are tasked with trying to find the Codex. The entire mission is just running and shooting. Eventually, we get introduced to the Idols and the Collective. Their whole group is essentially that they're just a group of what I can only describe as, like, cyber anarchists. Anyways, more shooting happens, and we eventually find the Codex. We are tasked with escorting the Codex, and we eventually end up in a glass floor trap that explodes. Some of the stuff in this mission just should have been cutscenes if I'm being completely honest, but for some reason they, I guess they just didn't want that at all. We escape from the trap that we were put in and we make our way out. We get another shooting section, we find a minigun as well as Myra Star, we ended up killing a bunch of Panteros and end up saving the star. After this we believe that all is good until we eventually hear, HOW THE F*** DID THIS HAPPEN?! Apparently, the idol stole the codex and replaced it with a fake. Atticus is pissed that we saved Myra Star while also trying to find the codex. He then tells us that we are replaceable and that the codex isn't. He then fires us and tells us that he will shoot us on site if we ever step foot on Marshall property again. We have no job, no guilt to potentially smash, and Kev is telling us at the very last second that the idols were also coming. Hey, I just got word that the idols are planning on attacking the museum. We then go through a depression moment because Kevin's a fucking idiot and he decides to go and DJ at a party for the idols. Like a true friend. We mope around the apartment and have a QTE featuring a goddamn toaster waffle and we order a bunch of knives just because of the fact that we got fired and we are completely sad. But one of those knives is a Judas knife. Way to be subtle with it guys. Nina gets a text telling her that the Panteros are going to attack the idols party. Realizing this, they have to go and rescue Kevin. Also, Eli was at the party with Kevin, and Eli gets shot. So they make their way to go rescue Kevin and Eli. Nina gets a call from Sergio to try to get him to stop attacking the party, but it doesn't work, and because of this, she decides to denounce her association with the Panteros. Kevin calls us finally and lets us know exactly what happened, and we get the only line of dialogue that honestly got a chuckle out of me. 
from the, both from the first time and the second time I've experienced this game. Kev, you all right? I'm fine, but you <laughs> shot me. You're doing great. Eli. <laughs> we make it to the party, do the shooty shoot, and meet up with Kev and Eli. Nina and the boss run into one of the members of the Idol Collective. Done in the back off, and Kevin chose to stand up for us. If they're with you, then you get to kill them. Honestly, pretty weak line, but so is a lot of this. Sh Kevin chose to collect a member, and now it's basically a mini boss fight. Except someone like him just won't become a normal NPC because he's supposed to be a special type of character. I would go on about my opinions about the idols as a whole in this game, but that would make this video just longer than it should be. The collective member dies, we run back to the apartment, but now it's a high speed chase where we're shooting rockets off the top of a roof of the car. Because that's a new feature. We then get the idea to become a criminal organization, Eli being the strategic one, Kev having a lot of connections, and Nina being thi- I mean, uh, and Nina being a really good driver, and just being really good at driving. Yeah. And us being only considered as what we call a walking murder party, we decide to put our skills on the table just to create our official criminal empire. It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. Ah, he said it! He said the line! He said the line! He said it! He said it! Ah! Ah! The nostalgia of the Saintro series has returned! Ah! We then host a meeting about how we're going to start our criminal empire, with the first thing needing to be essentially just finding a brand new place. Turns out there's an abandoned church on 3rd Street. <laughs> we enter the church is prepared to be demolished. We hijack a bulldozer, break stuff, Marshall shows up, we start shooting again. The church is owned by some guy named Bland, so we have to try to talk to him to tell us to give us the church. He tells us to piss off. We find the car that he's in. We scare him by driving on the wrong side of the road, driving around doing drifts, driving around doing stunt jumps, and that's really about it. He eventually gives us the deed, and we head back to the church. Kevin makes a post online about us getting the church, and because we need multiple multiple shooting sections in every single mission of this fucking game. We end up in another shootout with the idols and we end up killing yet another member of the collective. Going into this game, I was actually hoping to get to know just a little bit more about the idols as a faction. We have only truly seen their leaders in like two missions and two of them are already dead before we even got to actually know them. We took a look around the church, Nina finds the infamous Fleur de Lis. We stumble upon the painting on the wall, and that grants us the name of the Saints. We then host another meeting about making connections to get more cash for the Saints. The first person that we meet, of course, is Jim Rob. He tells us that the Panteros is messing with the garage by scaring people away, so he wants us to take care of it. We head to one location, do the shooty shoot, head to another location that has the stolen parts, do the shooty shoot again, blow shit up on the monster truck, run back to JR because he's being attacked by unknown character 76, do the shooty shoot again, and JR officially joins the Saints. This is where we're introduced to Criminal Ventures. These, of course, are activities that build your empire, and JR is technically your first, and we eventually get more in the future. The concept of Criminal Ventures are honestly pretty cool, but my only problem is that a lot of these are just activities that were from previous games, but some of them feel just 10 times worse than they did in the original. For example, Insurance fraud is one of my favorite activities to do from the previous games, but in this game, the ragdoll physics just feel worse than literally any of the other previous games, if I'm being 100% honest. The same could be said for Mayhem, as it's also one of my favorite activities. You can't really do that much when it comes to Mayhem as an activity by itself. You don't really have a wide selection of weapons, you're either using one weapon, two weapons, or like just inside of a vehicle of some sort, like a helicopter or a tank. It's just not as fun, and sadly, those are like my favorite two activities out of any of the Saints Row games, alongside with Fight Club, which of course isn't in this game, but there technically is one, but it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's trap. I'm, I'm rambling, I shouldn't be rambling, I should be talking about the rest of the story. The Saints need new recruits, so the best way that they could do it is through a live-streamed Battle Royale titled Boot Hill. This could have been something on the links of the Professor Ginky activities from Saints of the Third, and I could see it trying to have that sort of energy, but it honestly just doesn't. It's just very linear with your collection of weapons, and you fight to the end. And of all the missions so far, this is the most lackluster one in my opinion, especially the ending where once again you're just shooting on a turret. 
we win the tournament, and this gets people to want to sign and join up with the Saints. Some people who have probably already played this game will question why I haven't talked about certain missions. And the reason why is just because most of them are just filler. Filler missions such as teaching Eli how to shoot and trying to get Kevin a freckle bitch's happy meal isn't anything that's just truly worthy to the story. Oh wait, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's called FBs now. It's just called FBs. I'm not gonna... Yeah, let's, let's just move on. I will talk about one mission that had a major bug in it, and that mission was called Drawing Heat where the police will end up spawning in a location that wouldn't be able to be reached from where you are standing. I don't have a clip of it, so I had to actually try to find a screenshot from somebody actually playing the mission. So, yeah. Anyways, after that filler content, the next mission is just basically... We get <laughs> Translation. Sergio stole the car that Nina was working on because she left the Panteros. She wants to get it back and try to find where the Panteros are. We gun them down to find the car, but it's not there. Nina fears that they're going to try to chop the car for parts. We steal a Panteros car that she decides to not get inside of because this game is, well, this game. To eventually find a guy at a Panteros garage, we try to get him to tell us where Nina's car is. He says no. We then get told that the expression is, Shoot one in the face and they're dead. But f*** up their car. And they're nothing. Wait, what? It just takes us to vehicle customization. Honestly, kind of boring. It would have been more fun if we just got to actually mess up the car itself. But I guess we they needed us to just drive it to the next part. Anyways, the grunt tells us that Sergio took the car to push it off a cliff. We make it there, but Sergio succeeds in his plan. We then learn why this car is actually special to Nina, as we then find out that this car belonged to her mother, who we find out unfortunately died to cancer and didn't let anyone else drive it except for Nina. Because of the fact that the car held a lot of sentimental value, Nina wants to try to get back at Sergio and the Pantanos. Out of all the cutscenes that try to show some sort of emotion, this was a cutscene that would have made Nina just a character that we truly cared for and giving her an arc where she could have benefited as a character to get revenge on Sergio we would have it, it I, I don't know this what this game would have been better and I would have probably liked it more and Nina would have been my favorite character out of this entire game because the idea of a revenge arc for this character would have been 10 times better than what we unfortunately got let's go we can still catch up to him nah if Sergio's gonna with my family I'm gonna f with his we over to an abandoned vehicle warehouse on a helicopter that bugged out and couldn't let me fly because it put me in the goddamn passenger seat forcing me to restart the mission it's genuinely not lifting up it's genuinely not lifting up oh my god what is happening right now on our way to the warehouse, we do the shooty shoot again, this time in a big ol' helicopter. We sneak in through a vent, blow up vehicles, keep doing the shooty shoot, find Sergio's monster truck, destroy it, and leave. Esto es por ti, mama. Kind of similar to how this game has been treating the idols, we as the players still don't know exactly why the Panteros and Sergio are supposed to be the bad guys, because the story doesn't really give us a good reason like in previous games. For example, in Saints Row 1 and 2, we had moments where these characters that were the leaders of these factions had spotlights on them. We would know what their methods are, what makes them do the things that they do who these people are as individuals. While in this game, we're just told that characters like Sergio and the Collective are just bad people just because the game tells us that they are. It's honestly just really, really bad. Speaking of the idols, Kevin gets kidnapped by the Collective and we have to find him. After doing a brawl inside of a bar with some of the jankiest hand-to-hand -hand combat that I've ever seen in a video game in a long time, we find out that Kevin is not there, but his phone is. A quick shootout happens, we find an idol member hiding inside of a porta potty and drag him across the idol's camp. He tells us that Kevin is on the top of the scent to a list of sign and that it's rigged to explode. We kill the idols, defuse the bombs, and rescue Captain Teddy Waffle. 
We wing suit to the Idol's Mansion, crash their party, and kill another member of the Collective, who we still have no backstory or any reason to why they even do the shit that they do. It's starting to look pretty obvious that the Idols and the Panteros were just added into this game just for the sake of filler, and that's really it. Why? I have no clue, to be honest. Not a single clue. At all. In the next scene, the Saints play a board game while discussing how they're going to pay the crew better. Eventually, the idea of robbing a Marshall train comes up, but the Panteros are planning to attack the train according to Nina. The boss gets the idea to get another person to help us rob that train. That person, of course, is the Nawali, who is being currently held inside of a Marshall prison cell. So we make the plan to break him out of prison. The boss disguises himself as a martial guard to break in, we play through a stealth mission that isn't very stealthy. Basically we head to where the Nawali is locked up, but it's just walking through guards since we're still in uniform. We break him out, more shooting, and we make our escape. After breaking him out, he says that we're not friends, but he's willing to do the job. We get yet another filler mission that doesn't do anything but just has a shoot the entire time. Basically, we just have to get donuts for a meeting and we're trying to get the donuts. It turns out that someone just put a hit on us through the Wanted app. And let me basically explain what that is. The Wanted app is essentially just the Hitman activities from the previous game, but it's done more on the concept of it being like a dating app, except instead of you're trying to find your love partner, you're just trying to find a way to easily make money by shooting someone in the head. And for each and every time you pick a specific target to hit, it does give you like a little bit of a story for that specific hit. Kevin picks us up from the firefight and he tells us that he knows the people who made the app. They take us off the app so we aren't being chased anymore. It's kind of pointless. Now for anybody somehow making it this far into the video, I'm just going to say this right now. You might want to buckle your butt cheeks. Because the next portion of this game really made people so mad they instantly turned their backs on this game when they found out that this was in this new entry into the Saints Row franchise. And that, my friends, is the LARPing missions. We meet with Eli who tells us about an event titled the Dust Moot to explain what it is. We have unique weapons that shoot nerf darts instead of bullets and outfits made of cardboard. The reason why we're doing this mission is because Gwen is involved in the story. Yes, Gwen. That Gwen from the beginning of the story. You know, our former superior. Anyways, we get into a shootout, but now with unique death animation, since it's now LARP. We burn a beacon and begin another shootout. Once that's done, we invade Fort Tate Worm to steal tape. We then build our own fortress titled Sandy Kraken, which eventually becomes another criminal venture. The only reason it's a venture is because we are tasked to light two other beacons in the desert so we can progress through this part of the story. In the next mission, we drag Nina into the LARPing thing to find the lair of the Balrod, which is literally just an SUV. But it's missing parts to the Balrod because Gwen stole them, so we have to find Fort Phoenix to get the parts back by going into the fortress with stealth. We then cross our arms because we took a potion that makes us invisible so that we can take up the guards and find the parts. You guys wanna brace yourself for this cringe cause now I'm gonna go full character. <sighs> we then wage battle against those of Fort Phoenix. Elijah the Wise as well as I, the great Bossonius journey to searcheth the keep. After vanquishing our foes, Bossonius descends downward to the lovely Ninefer Leadfoot to giveth her final piece to summon the Balrod using ancient chants of the greats. We choo che, Dungar Eda, Dungar Eda, Rhoda sees Nachi. Who wrote this sh? I hate myself. Basically, we get all the parts to complete the summoning. We search for Eli, who is pinned down in a shack. We don't do much shooting, and but instead use a big ass horn for something or something like that. Eli gets saved thanks to the bow rod. And in our finale of the LARPing trilogy, we get invaded by House Phoenix. I'm sorry, Fort Phoenix. We defend the fort and make our way over to Fort Thunderpump. After invading Fort Thunderpump, we have one more final bout against Gwen. We have a moment after we've drained her health where she claims that she didn't get hit. I hit you, you're dead. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Fucking proven. 
This happens a second time until she finally surrenders. We then reach the Dust King and enter what is probably the goofiest ending to literally any of the storylines we have seen so far. We then take the crown and Sandy Kraken rules all. If I'm being completely honest, I really didn't hate the LARPing missions all that much. They have a little bit of charm to them in my opinion, and honestly got a chuckle out of me a few times. They do a good job by simply giving a distraction for the rest of the story because it's just all bad, but the only thing I wish just wasn't affected by this was Gwen. This is the only time we see Gwen in her final moments in this game as she doesn't make a single appearance as an enemy for the rest of the game. I am genuinely serious. She is a part of Marshall and we don't even get to see any moments of her later on in the future? WHY?! Around this time we are nearing the end of this game's story. The next mission begins with the Nawali meeting us at the church to meet the rest of the crew. And for whatever reason, instead of deciding to plan the heist that we decided to talk about when it comes to robbing the train, we instead decided to go on a team building exercise. And the first thing that we see is our crew deciding to give each and every one of the characters, especially one of the badass looking ones in this entire game, a Waffle Cat hat. This entire mission is honestly just pretty boring. The whole concept is that the mission is that they're trying to go on a so-called killcation, but the entire time it's just them driving from one location, shooting enemies, to drive to another location to shoot more enemies, and the dialogue mentions stuff that doesn't even matter, like Ghost Pepper Knight and wanting to do karaoke. Basically, nothing goes to Saint's way, so they find the only way to make these characters actually bond together is to fight their enemies, and we end up in the Nawali secret bunker and once again fight off an entire horde of enemies and we make off with a couple of jet bikes and the Nawali takes a liking to us and is considering to join the Saints as well as doing the heist mission. If you're wondering why I sound so drained when talking about majority of this stuff it's just because a lot of this story is just fucking boring. We finally get to the train heist mission. We end up meeting up with the Nawali to get ready to attack the Marshall train, but before we do, the boss decides to give the Nawali a Judas knife. He accepts it as a gift of gratitude and thanks us. We get to the train and start shooting, destroying service, disable turrets, more shooting, move to the next part of the train, the train gets detached, Nina picks us up on a jet bike, more shooting, but now the Panteros are here. At this point, we've just been doing nothing but shooting more grunts and end up fighting just tougher grunts. But then, finally, we get a moment where we're about to finally have that 1v1 confrontation with Sergio as he jumps off the helicopter. We prepare to- <laughs> Okay. Never mind. Instead of having your leader of one of the main factions of your game be a boss fight, the one that looks the most intimidating, you have him get killed in a cutscene. You Philippe Lorendas. Again! Why? <laughs> and what's even worse, we still have no idea who Sergio was as a character. Literally, we, we didn't know anything about Sergio as a character. All that we knew was that he was just a big man who drove a big monster truck. And apparently his only weakness is an old man with a thick mustache. Bruh! 
Uh, we do more of the same shit over and over again. More shooting, disable turn, keep moving forward, more shooting, get trapped in a- you, you get the idea! We get in a tank, start blowing stuff up in said tank, shit starts getting really intense, and the train stops, we find the money, everyone gets paid, including the Nawali, and we all celebrate with a money fight. And Kevin almost died by getting hit with a gold brick. After the heist, we needed to do something a bit bigger to make a statement because the Nawali killed Sergio. So Kevin comes up with the idea to steal the Hummingbird Codex, which once again, we don't know anything about because this game doesn't tell us anything about any of the stuff that's supposed to be important to the story. We head to a boat shop and just like every other mission, we start off guns blazing and eventually we end up in a vault to find the Codex and to the surprise of absolutely no one. It's a trap. The idol set a bomb in a vault to kill us all, but we end up defusing it. We then make our way to the idol's cruise ship that actually has the codex. The plan is to just steal the codex and have one of the members of the saints in a helicopter fly us back home. We get to the ship, more shooting happens until we find the codex and we find out that it's actually booby trapped. Again. We disarm the trap, steal the codex, and rid the entire boat to explode. Everything goes awry because the idols destroy the helicopter. Another shootout happens and we kill more of the idol collective. Okay, so right here is where I would make a joke about how this game just didn't give a shit about any of the leaders of the factions in this game, and I'm just not even gonna mention it. I've actually lost count of how many we've killed so far in regards to this game's story, so I'm not even gonna talk about it. Let's just say that they're all dead. We still don't know anything about them. They're not important to the story. They're they're just dead. They're just dead characters. This isn't even a part of the script. I'm actually just fucking rambling because this is this is ridiculous. The bomb goes off and we have to escape. We end up having the codex and the boss decides to give a speech, which eventually goes out of sync due to the mocap and the voice lines that are given with our main character. Without being told that your time will come, you just have to wait. Be patient. Well, let me tell you something. We're fucking done waiting. After capturing the Codex, we prepare to set up the party at the church. One of Marshall's lawyers shows up and claims that the Saints are technically owned by Marshall Industries. We shoot the lawyer in the face, head over to Marshall HQ. We end up battling Marshall and try to head over to the top floor. And the entire time, Eli is just trying to tell us that killing is not the answer. And the entire time, we are just telling him to shut the f*** up. We finally get to Marshall's office and end up meeting... Myra Star? The Gilf? That we saved at the beginning of the game? Her? She tells us that Atticus left the very second that we entered the building. We then tell her that we wanted ownerships of the saints back, and she says she'll help us by doing us one personal favor. That favor being to make Atticus look bad, drop Marshall's stock, and help him get voted out by the board of the directors. We accept the deal, of course. We head to a shipping yard, fight off guards, blow up cars as we wait for a tank that we have to steal. We then take it over, roam around the city, blow things up, which does indeed drop their stock. It's a very simple mission. Atticus storms the office and blames the Saints. Myron wants to vote on whether or not Atticus should remain chairman of the board. The votes end up in a tie, and we, as in the boss, end up being the tiebreaker, which gives us the option to either shoot him in the face or fire him. Which one do you think I picked? We finally reach the finale of the story. The party finally begins, and the saints meet up together at the entrance of the church. Nawali shows up to see the festivities. He tells us about how he always saw having friends as a weakness, and believing that the power of friendship is what makes the boss stronger, and he wants to know what that feels like. And then, in the most obvious plot twist that was directly in your face, Nawali STABS US WITH THE GODDAMN JUDAS KNIFE! His reasoning for stabbing and betraying us is because he does not have friends. Honestly, out of any group of people to have as friends, why would you want to be friends with these three? Nina I can probably understand because she do be sick. But not the other two, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Volition. Like, no, not these two. These two fuckers can go home. We end up in a dream sequence 
where we are reminded of some of the mementos of the game's story. Things like Nina's car, Eli's whiteboard, Kevin's fucking waffle iron, and the cat being a goddamn cat meowing the whole time. Eventually, we stumble upon the board game that we played before we freed the Nawali. This part is just collecting things the entire time until we reach Kevin. Eli wanted you to get llamas, Nina wanted you to get a baby elephant, and Kevin wanted you to get snails. Once we try to find a third snail, we enter the barn and suddenly... Nightmare, 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 nightmare! This part of the mission is you trying to find your friends and the entire time you try to find them, they just berate you for not doing something in the story. If you'd been there at the idols party, I wouldn't have gotten shot. Eli getting shot was not even our fault. He could have simply just not have gone to the party. Nina, I got your back. You? You couldn't even kill Sergio. The Nawali had to do it for you. We could have decided to go after him instead of just blowing up some dumbass cars. Cam? I wasn't calling you. Don't you get it? You're just not a good enough friend. Bitch, you are the most useless motherfucker in this whole group. The majority of missions that you were in were just filler. And most of it was just stuff that damn near got us killed over something stupid. But I'm the bad friend. Me? Me! The one who basically did every single thing that one of these jackasses wanted me to do the entire time. I'm the bad friend. Yeah, sure, okay, whatever, fine. Man. Eventually we reach the part where the Nawali tells us that we can't do anything right and now everything including the saints and our friends belong to him. For some reason Snickerdoodle, who I have never mentioned by name throughout the entirety of this review, is the voice of reason to get us out of the burial that we were placed in because, once again, we were buried alive. We open up our phone and listen to every single voice message that was sent to us, with the obvious end result being that the Nawali killed every single person in that party except for these three idiots for some reason. And instead of tying them to a chair or just doing literally anything else that can be considered as villainous, they decide to recreate the very first introduction scene that we get for these three characters. But Kevin is finally wearing a shirt, Snickerdoodle's in a cage, they're in a studio set, and instead of wanting waffles, they want pancakes. I'm not even going to question why they did this. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Just like the rest of this game. None of it makes sense. We end up calling the Nawali to tell him that we're going to save our friends and he says he'll be ready. We head to the safe house, grab weapons, mow down Nawali's gang, and make our way to the first place where we encountered him. We end up at Silver Gulch and we get into the cutscene, which is, I won't lie, is probably one of the only other cutscenes that I liked in this game. Alright, here's the deal. You motherfuckers know where your boss is keeping my friends. So how about you just tell me, and then I can be on my way. Any takers? I know it's not likely, but, you know, I figure I should do due diligence. It's really in your best interest. I, I only need one of you alive to tell me what I need to know, and the odds of it being you is pretty... You know what? F*** it. I tried. This is the part where I basically explain what the mission is, but if you can already tell by the majority of the stuff that we talked about when it comes to the missions of this game, they are all, literally, the exact same formula. After doing the exact same thing where it's basically just us shooting the entire time, eventually a member of Nawali's crew shows up named George, and he gives us the address on exactly where the Nawali is. And then we decide to just knock him out because we felt like it. You'd think that giving him a name would mean that they could be of use some time in the future? But they obviously went down the route that just giving them a name makes us assume that he's just a random grunt in the Saints now. We fly in on a VTOL and we make it to Noali's location. Eventually we make it inside and the alarm goes off. Noali ties up our friends as we make our way to save them. More shooting happens until we then make it to the dim lit set and attempt to rescue. We sneak up on the Nawali from a rafter and we try to untie our friends to actually try to save them. Eventually he gets back up and puts us in a chokehold where we then save this line. You don't get it. They don't need my help. I need theirs. 
I hate this goddamn cat. And by the power of teamwork, they work together to turn down the As he's running for his life. We chase after him, at some point we genuinely put him in a stun lock by just kicking him multiple times. Suddenly, helicopter battle, we shoot with multiple rockets, it crashes on top of the building. We get our final stun off and we kill an Awali. to then be met with the rest of the saints on the top of the building to celebrate and have a drink. You know, the saints have only been around for like a minute and we've already gained and defeated a nemesis. Not a bad start. No, not bad at all. The story was painful and forgettable the first time I played and it's even worse the second time. You know, throughout the entire video, I've just only been talking about this game's story, but I haven't actually gotten to talk about the gameplay, so let's just talk about it in this review, and all I can really say is that it's just not good at all. For lack of better words, melee combat as well as just gunplay is just extremely bad, and just, if anything, just absolutely piss poor. It's so diff when playing this game it's just not fun at all and the fact that literally every single mission in this game feels exactly the same with nothing really all that different it just gets to the point where the whole game just feels like a complete blur of doing the exact same thing over and over and over and over and over again and a lot of features from previous games just were not included in this game for some reason or another you can't recruit homies from off of the street, you can't use enemies or other NPCs as human shields, you can't even attack clerks in the game, and you can't even hold people hostage inside of cars that you stole from them. They never really explained the reasons why for any of this stuff, but my only guess is simply to just avoid any sort of controversy, which still doesn't really make that much sense. I'm not saying that this is the official reason, but this is just a potential guess. Now, so far I've only been negative throughout the entirety of this video when it comes to just talking about this game, but there are some things that I do like about this game, and I'll just talk about those really quick. The wingsuit ability is actually pretty good, because this map is just very, very huge, and it does make traversal pretty much easier. I already mentioned when it comes to customization, as well as the RGB sliders, when it comes to making unique styles of colors. And I didn't even talk about this throughout the entirety of this game, because I can't really play it during any of the gameplay footage that I've shown. But the soundtrack in this game is actually pretty decent, and during my original playthrough, I was just listening to tracks from stations like Outrun, which is more of a synthwave type of radio station, and The Cypher, which is more old school hip-hop, so you'll see, see things like DMX, or Tribe Called Quest, or even Busta Rhymes, just as a couple of examples. The map of Santo Eleso is a great looking, vibrant, colorful map that I do just think just looks really, really good, with my only real negative criticism being that it just feels so goddamn empty. You can't go into a good chunk of buildings in this map, and a lot of the missions take place in specific locations for missions, just like in Saints of the Third. And you can't even go into interiors during free roam. This also goes for the Saints Tower, which you can also unlock by just completing all of the criminal ventures. Well, just buying all the criminal ventures, but yeah. That's really all the good stuff that I could say about this game, and I could end the review here and just summarize all of my opinions up, but sadly we still have more to talk about. It's DLC time, and we begin with our first expansion, being the Heist and the Hazardous. We start off in a brand new district known as Sunshine Springs, and just like the rest of the map, it looks good. I just wish that the city itself was just more alive when it comes to its NPCs. The first mission of this DLC begins with us hearing about a $1 million bounty, so of course we go and accept it. We are told that the target is inside of a shooting range, so we make our way and literally do the exact same thing that we've been doing in every single mission throughout this entire goddamn video game. We find the guy we're looking for, we snipe him, and head over to the contact's mansion. 
Turns out the person who set the bounty is a guy who is an actor named Chris Hardy. He's known for a movie series that's basically just named after this DLC. Who would have thought? Our main character assumes that we're getting paid once we reach the house, but apparently our payment is an autographed headshot of Chris Hardy. We're pissed about it and instead of grabbing a gun and shooting him in the face, we just complain about it and he hits us with his catchphrase. My game, my rules, and you just rolled snake eyes. His bodyguard knocks us out and throws us off of the penthouse. The Saints make a plan to instead of go after Chris Hardy, they plan to rob him of his possessions and movie props. The next mission is literally just us getting photos of Chris Hardy to scan his face so that we could disguise ourselves as Chris. What you are looking at is supposed to be a cutscene. No animation, no mocap, just a single image being moved around to explain what the plan is. This mission is just boring. You're moving from one spot to scan one side of his face and then do the exact same thing a total of three different times. You probably think that there is a mission that you have to do to get the abilities for you to turn yourself into a hologram of a person that you just scanned. But nope, you just somehow have the technology, just like with the wingsuit. Keep in mind, you could also do this specific mission as soon as you unlock the church as your main safe house. Makes sense, right? Just like a lot of the shit in this game. Finally, after you scan this man's face, you and the saints make your way to the heist, beginning with you walking around, mingling with guests, until you let Eli sneak inside of the house. You head upstairs as Chris, knock out some of the martial guards, and sneak your way to find the vault. This mission is somewhat stealthy, as you have to intentionally not get spotted. There's also a section where you have to get through some lasers and stuff like that. After that happens, you find the vault, but Chris finds out that you snuck inside and are trying to rob him. Martial guards try to stop us, but the vault gets blown up from the inside by Nina and Kevin. We steal the props and put them in the back of the car with Kev and Nina. We fight off martial guards, make our way to the roof, and fly off in a helicopter. While inside of the helicopter, we have to protect Nina and Kevin from Marshall. We do all this, and at the end of the mission, we get the coolest stunt in the entire game. Kevin and Nina, they're driving off of Hardy's driveway. Oh, fuck! I'm sorry. They drive off Hardy's driveway, and we have to catch them with a magnet. If I'm being completely honest, this moment would have just been cooler if it was just a cutscene, but... I'm guessing that Volition didn't have the budget. Oh, Hardy is sad and depressed that we stole all of his things and we hit him with his own catchphrase. My game, my rules, and you just roll snake eyes. After this mission, we do unlock his crib as our own and that's really about it. This DLC is extremely short. You could literally do all this stuff within less than an hour. Probably like 30 minutes more than likely. One thing that is honestly the worst thing about this DLC is that you can only play through it once in your save. This is one of the main reasons I decided to replay this game in its entirety. Not just because I wanted to show you how mind-blowingly terrible this game is, but that the majority of the things that you could do in previous games just simply can't be done so if i as a player who wanted to replay the dlc i literally can't do that unless i start the video game from the very beginning or if i make a current save where i haven't even touched the dlc yet did i mention that this news district is completely free for anybody who just didn't even decide to buy the dlc i probably didn't but for those who didn't know now you know. The next DLC I'm going to be talking about is Doc Ketchum's Murder Circus, which is a single player focus mode. It's really not even all that interesting if I'm being completely honest. Realistically, it's just something similar to the Boot Hell mission, except you're playing as a random selection of characters that the game gives us. It's honestly just a waste of time and not really worth talking about. It doesn't really add that much to the table and doesn't really feel like something that should be paid DLC. Something like this was technically in previ a previous Saints Row game, and that was Saints Row the Third, and that was called Horde Mode, which was available completely for free. 
Now, this is the part where I would talk about the final DLC expansion, but while I'm recording this, uh, the DLC comes out within actually a few days. I wrote a month in here just in case I still finished all this within a month. But more than likely, I'll just record my live reaction and put it somewhere in this video. So if it's here, then it's here. And if it's not, then look out for a video sometime in the future, I guess. <sighs> and that's my review of the Saints Row reboot. Finally, I got all my feelings and thoughts about this entire game out of the way. Holy crippling anxiety, there's an entire part that I completely forgot that's in this game. Right, so remember the criminal ventures that I brought up earlier in this video and the fact that I brought up the Saints Tower being the last thing that you unlock within this game? Well, apparently there's one final mission that you get. And the only way we could actually do it is if we actually bought the Saints Tower, which cost over eight million dollars. And the only way we could do it is if we legitimately grind throughout the entirety of this game. And after hours of grinding just to get all this money as legitimately as possible, just so that I could show you guys the ending of this game, here's the final result of what we've done after playing throughout the entirety of this game and just getting all of the criminal ventures. What do we get? If you see a faded sign at the side of the road that says We get the entirety of this godforsaken cast singing Love Shack to us. It's a musical number. We get a musical number at the end of this game. Now, okay, I'm going to try to do this in the most calm way possible and just do it as honestly as I can. This is completely undeserved. I'm just gonna say this right now, there is nothing worth celebrating about the majority of the stuff that happened within this game. I could understand it when it came to Saints Row 4, I could understand doing the karaoke sing-along with Pierce in the car during the Saints Row the Third mission that didn't really mean anything, that wasn't even a full-on cutscene, as long as I was doing that exact same thing again in Saints Row 4 with Pierce once again, but having Zinyak interrupt us while singing two different tracks at the same time, and I could understand when it was the Saints Row forecast just dancing to this is how we do it at the end, even though the entire planet has been destroyed, the aliens have taken over, and everyone that we know and love is dead. But this, 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 just, just no. There is nothing to celebrate within this story. Oh yay, we killed a Nawali who was an obvious villain. Oh yay, we saved our friends that we don't even care about as characters. Oh yay, we defeated the factions that don't even matter within this story. <laughs> so, the question that probably is on your mind is what do I think of the Saints Row reboot? And if that's been on your mind this entire time, then I only have one question for you. Have you not been paying attention? As somebody who's been a long time diehard fan of the Saints Row franchise, Saints Row 2022 to me is like a Netflix adaptation of a really good anime. It's trying its hardest to imitate something that was once really good, but knowing it would never capture the same magic as the previous entries. Oh, from the story, to the forgettable characters, to its gameplay, to its driving mechanics, and even just the the life of the game's city is just awful in every single way. I've seen multiple people make video after video after video talking about how bad this game is. From popular YouTubers to people who have been the main faces of the Saints Row community themselves with obvious conclusions that this game is overall terrible. It's just boring, bland, lifeless, and the most pathetic excuse of a Saints Row game I've ever seen in my entire life. I know some people, including the ones I mentioned in this video, that believe that Saints Row the Third was truly where the series died. I personally don't think that at all. Saints Row the Third, in my opinion, is still one of my favorites alongside with Saints Row 2 when it comes to replay value and just wanting to replay the older Saints Row games. The community has already been divided when it comes to the people who love the first two games and the people who love the later entries. But once this game released, everyone came together unanimously and said that this game was awful. I love all of these games for various different reasons and just casually replay them when I'm in the mood. The only reason I made this review is because I needed to finally get my feelings off of my chest. 
after this game, I don't see a bright future for the Saints Row series. I'm just being 100% honest. But Volition being merged with Gearbox, one of two things may happen. Either we will never see a brand new Saints Row game again, or we will never be getting the Saints Row 2 patch on PC. So as stated in their April newsletter, Volition is moving to Gearbox and is eager to work on games beyond Saints Row. In fact, what I hear is they really don't want to make another Saints Row game, at least anytime soon. But this is where it gets really complicated. While Volition has moved to Gearbox, the IP is staying with Deep Silver. And I heard through the grapevine that Deep Silver wants to greenlight a Saints Row sequel ASAP. So it looks like we might be getting a Saints Row sequel that's not made by Volition. The last bit of news I have is related to the Saints Row 2 patch. It's nothing major, but I just want to let you guys know that it's officially being worked on again. They haven't done anything with it for well over a year because they've been working on this awful reboot, but the final DLC is around the corner, and they're starting to actively prepare things to get back to work. This is actually how I found out that Deep Silver still owns the Saints Row IP. Deep Silver has to get some things approved by Gearbox in order for Volition to start working on it again. This game is 110% the death of Saints Row. I don't recommend anyone purchase this game at all. Not for $60, not for $20. Even if they offer it for free through some sort of subscription, don't even try to redeem it. I also don't even recommend pirating the game. Not just because I think piracy is wrong. I just think that you would be better off literally pirating any other video game that's coming out very, very soon. What I'm basically saying is, is that this game isn't even worth your time. It's not worth your money. It's not worth your time. It's not worth any sort of second of your life. But yeah, that's going to be it for this video. If you got something out of this video, then please be sure to hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new to content like this. I'm mainly a pro wrestling game channel, but... I now kind of want to dive into talking about other sorts of video games that I truly care about. And the Saints Row series have always been something that I really cared about for a very long time. But I just don't really want to make videos on those games because I felt like because of the current state that this game put the entire franchise on, it's it's not going to, it's, I don't know. It just doesn't look good for either this franchise or anybody who talks about Saints Row in general. But anyways, thank you for watching. Before I go, uh, let me just do this really quickly. I would like to give you my personal list of every single video game that I would personally recommend that you get right here, right now, whether it be in any sort of methods. I recommend you play literally any of these other games other than Saints Row 2022, because those games are worth more of your time. So with that being said, my name is Dende. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next video, whatever the hell that is. Peace. evidence against you has failed to appear. How do you explain that? You must be a very dangerous man, Malaysia. I'm the best racer that ever came out of Chinatown. How come I've never heard? Because I got tits. Is that what you call those? <laughs>